Heads up guys, my name is Zichiano, welcome back to my C++ series. So continuing on with our journey through data structures, we're going to be taking a look at dynamic or growable, resizable arrays, whatever you want to call them, essentially the STD vector class that is given to us as part of the standard template library. Now this is not to be confused with the more common mathematical term vector, which usually refers to some kind of direction or position in two, three or four dimensional space. A vector in this sense refers to just an array. And this actually also has a mathematical basis where vector can also be defined as an ordered sequence of values, which is kind of what this contiguous array is. If you're not familiar with SCD vector, I suggest that you check out the videos that I've made on that topic already. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at how we can write something similar to the SCD vector class. We're going to be writing this ourselves from scratch with the purpose of learning a little bit more about data structures and about how this vector class works. And as such, our goal is to essentially replicate the behavior, the same behavior of that SCD vector class so that you should be able to more or less interchange it. We do the same thing with just the SCD array class, which is like a fixed size stack allocated array. Check out that video if you haven't already. Let's talk a little bit about what it actually takes to write a vector class, but first, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. For those of you who don't know, Skillshare is a massive online learning community where millions of creative and curious people come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare has thousands of different classes for you to choose from, whether you're interested in illustration or photography, or even just something as simple as being productive, because who doesn't have issues with that. I really like how most of their classes are really high quality and they're also nice and bite-sized, meaning each little episode or each stage of the class can be watched in about five minutes. And coming in at just under $10 a month for an annual subscription, it's a great way to add a few more skills into your lives. Skillshare have been nice enough to offer the first 1,000 people who sign up using the link in the description below two free months of Skillshare Premium. Two months to learn whatever you like. Check out the link in the description below guys and take a look at all the different classes that Skillshare has to offer. Speaking of learning, what does it actually take to write a vector class? How do we do something like this? Now, personally speaking, I think writing out all of these data structures, even though they already exist and you don't technically need to do this to actually write any programs, doing this is going to help you a great deal if you're learning the language or if you're looking at becoming better at C++. The cool thing with data structures is that they deal with data. That's what you should be dealing with and thinking about when you're writing your code. And as such, even though something as simple as a vector or an array might seem really simple, you can actually extend it quite a lot. I mean, take a look at the standard template library code. It's so big and complex because it deals with every little corner case. It deals really with everything and it supports all of the newest language features. So even if you think writing a vector might be a little bit too simple for you, think again because I'm sure you can get a lot out of it. I also think that a good way to follow this series as we start exploring more and more data structures is to try and write it on your own. Pause the video right now and try and implement your own vector class first. Think about what a vector class actually is. We'll cover that in just a second and try and write it out yourself and then compare your solution with mine. That's a really good exercise and it's also a good way to make sure that you're actually thinking about how to do things yourself and learning instead of just copying down my code and moving on with your life. So what is this vector data structure? Well, I mentioned that it is a resizable array and that's probably the, the biggest thing to note here. But the other huge thing that I think of when I think of the SCD vector class is that the data there is heap allocated. This is a direct contrast to what we had with the standard array class because that was completely on the stack. As such, it was completely fixed. It was not only fixed, but we had to actually determine the size at compile time. Whereas with vector, apart from being dynamic, so we don't even have to think about the size if we don't want to, although we can, we have that option to kind of initialize it with a given size. But even so, we don't have to think about the size at compile time because we just push back more and more data, it resizes everything there is dynamic and runtime. That is a huge difference. And because of that, there are so many reasons why you would want to choose the array class over the vector class, because if you don't need heap allocations, then don't use them. They're going to slow down your program. So with that in mind, the core mechanics of a vector class really are quite simple if you think about them. I mean, all we really need is a 
pointer to some heap allocated memory. That's going to be our actual data buffer. That's where we store all of the elements inside the array. And as we keep pushing back more and more elements, we're going to get to a point where we don't have enough room to store our new element because we've obviously allocated a fixed size of memory. We can't just grow it. What do we do when we hit that wall? Well, it's pretty simple. All we really need to do is allocate a new block of memory that has enough room for this new element and possibly more, then just copy across all of our elements from our old block of memory into our new block of memory, and then delete the old block of memory. That's it. Now, if I've trained you well, that might seem like a lot. I mean, we're allocating this larger block of memory. We're copying across all the elements from the old block into the new block of memory, then freeing the old block of memory. That kind of sounds not that great for performance, right? Right. That's why vector resizing and all these heap allocations really aren't great. We might explore them in more depth a little bit later. I did actually make a video about optimizing the usage of STD vector to try and avoid these resizes because every time we have to grow our array, we have to grow our vector. That's usually not, a, not, not, it's just not great for performance and we want to avoid it, especially if our vector happens to have a lot of elements inside it. Now, based on the description that I've given now, go ahead and think about how you would implement this class. And if you're really cool, maybe you'll actually try and write it your own way right now. If you're serious about getting better at C++ and learning all of these things, then definitely do that before you watch the rest of this video. On top of the brief overview that I've just given, there's a lot of optimizations and a lot of room for optimizations. For example, instead of copying across all of the elements from the old block into the new block, it's a lot better to try and move those elements from the old block into the new block using move semantics, which I also talked about in a recent video. If you're storing a vector of a thousand strings and you move them instead of copying them, for example, that's going to provide a huge performance benefit. So definitely move instead of copy in that case. But anyway, as I mentioned, there are so many things we could add to this vector class and this video will probably be hours long. What we're gonna take a look at today is a basic implementation with just the base features that you would probably want to implement first in a vector class and then in the future we may revisit this and extend it a little bit more with some of the more advanced features. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at how we can write a vector class. So as mentioned last time we took a look at static arrays and this was some of the example code that we used to test that out. I really like writing down some example code for a class that I'm about to write in a lot of cases because it helps a lot with the API design. So what I'll do here is I'll pretend that the vector class already exists even though it doesn't. And let's go ahead and write down this exact same example basically. I'll just call this vector and then I'm just going to use it as I would with a vector. So I'll push back maybe a string here called Cherno or something like that. And then of course I'll also push back C++. So obviously a very basic test here. We're going to expand this API a lot more, but this is kind of like my bare bones vector class. We should be able to just easily create it like this with no concept of size and then push back at least like a couple elements and see it hopefully grow with that in mind. Now, what I'm gonna do to test this out is I'll also type in something like vector. I'll add a third element here because as you'll see in a minute, we're actually going to initialize our vector to have a size of two by default. Okay, so now that we have a very basic example, let's jump into this vector.h file, which is completely blank and take a look at how we would write this. So obviously it's going to be a templated type here, a templated class, I should say. So last time when we wrote this array class, we actually kind of made a very simple version of it without any templates. So if templates are still something that confuse you a little bit, it's probably worth going back to that video and taking a look at how I implemented array without templates before then moving on to templates, because I think that'll probably help you out. But since we're big boys now, we're going to just implement a templated version of the vector class here. So we obviously need a constructor. And the primary thing that this constructor has to do is actually allocate some memory for us to store. Now you don't necessarily have to do this. You could just say that, okay, if we create an empty vector, then no memory allocation whatsoever. Only when we push back that first element will allocate memory. In the interest of keeping this a little bit more simple though, I am actually going to allocate enough room for two elements here, just because this will simplify a little bit of the whole growing math operations that we end up doing. So what exactly does a vector store? Well, an array of course stores just a stack allocated array of this type here with this kind of compile time template parameter size. Whereas this is going to store instead a pointer to whatever our type is. And we'll call this M underscore data. We'll set it equal to null pointer by default, just so that our code is a little bit easier to debug. And then we also need to keep track of two different size variables. 
we want to keep track of a variable called size, which is going to be the number of elements that are actually inside our vector. So in other words, if we take a look at this, we'll push back one element, our size should be one, two should be two, three should be three. It's going to actually keep track of how many elements we have. Additionally, though, we're going to store a variable called capacity. And this is going to be how much memory we have allocated. So how many elements worth of memory have we actually allocated? Not necessarily present inside the vector at the moment, but how much could we store without having to reallocate? So why do we need these two variables? Why not just have a size? Well, we could, and that would be totally fine, and you could write a vector that way, it would work. The problem though, is that you'll be reallocating the memory a lot more often if you store just the exact amount of memory required to store the number of elements that are currently inside that vector. So for example, if I pushed back a lot of these, and I mean a lot, we don't want to reallocate every time we push back an element. That's going to be terribly inefficient. Instead, what we want to do is use some kind of like growing function, essentially, that's going to say that, okay, well, let's start, for example, with a size of two. And then maybe every time we have to reallocate, because a new element is pushed back, let's maybe double our capacity. So let's allocate enough for four. That way we don't have to allocate again when we push the fourth element in. When we push the fifth element in, maybe it'll double again and it'll go to eight. That way these three are gonna be pushed back no problem. And then when we push back the ninth one, it'll double to 16 and so on and so forth. So in other words, we'll drastically reduce the number of reallocations we need to ensure that we have enough storage to store all of these elements. Now doubling the capacity every time we need to reallocate is definitely something you could do, but we're going to do something a little bit more conservative in terms of space. What we're going to do is add on half of the current capacity. So in other words, we'll, we'll grow from two to three from three to four, from four to six, from six to nine, and so on and so forth, just because it's a little bit more conservative on memory. But this is the beauty of writing your own data structures. You can actually easily control that to tailor it towards a specific need in your application. Maybe you know that you're going to be pushing back a lot of elements and you want it to be a little bit more generous with the amount of memory it allocates. That's totally fine. But then again, keep in mind that usually with vectors, you can actually specify an initial size or an initial allocation to prevent having to reallocate every time you push back new elements. Anyway, back in the vector class, that's why we have these two, because one is the actual amount of elements inside the vector, whereas the other one keeps track of our capacity for elements. How much could we store with our current memory allocation? So the most important function here then in the beginning is going to be something that I'm going to call realloc, reallocate. What this is going to do is reallocate our memory. And it's basically got three things that it really needs to do. Let's make this a private function because we shouldn't be calling this outside of this class. And I'm actually going to take in a size T here, which is going to be our new capacity. And initially I'm going to allocate enough room for two elements here. So what does this function need to do? Well, step one is it needs to allocate a new block of memory. Now in more complicated vector implementations, such as SCD vector, you have the option of specifying a custom allocator. And this can be really useful if you're designing a piece of software that you really want to perform well, and maybe you're giving it an allocator that won't necessarily hit the heap every time it has to allocate. We're not gonna bother with that with our simple implementation here though, we'll just use the new operator. Then what it needs to do is copy all of our existing elements in our vector over into this new block of memory. Remember, even though we're using this in the constructor here where we have no elements, this could be used for resizing from say four to six. So in other words, if we push in our fifth element, perhaps we want to resize this to a capacity of six. Once we've allocated a new block of memory, which is enough to hold all of our elements, or in this case, it's going to be the size of new capacity here. Once we've done that, we need to copy across all of our old elements into this new block of memory. So that's the next step, copy. Now I'm saying copy, but realistically you want to try and move them for sure, because copying them is going to be not only a waste of performance, it's just gonna be unnecessary because clearly we're going to be deleting the old block of memory, which is our third step. So copy slash move old elements into new block. This is what our reallocation function looks like. So now let's implement it. It's not going to be too hard. First, I'm gonna make a T pointer here. We'll call this new block. And this is going to just simply be new T with our new capacity. Simple as that. Now we could use like maybe a unique pointer here or a shared pointer or something like that. I never like using smart pointers when I'm kind of this low level into things. If I'm dealing with like allocations and custom data structures, 
I think that using smart pointers is just an unnecessary layer on top of everything else. If we're designing a data structure, we want to access memory as low level as we can. So that's why I'm using raw pointers here. So once we've allocated this block, we now need to move everything from the old block into the new block. So to do that, we'll simply write a for loop that goes through all of the elements that currently exist. So we can just use M size here and we'll just copy them across. And we can do that like this. Now we are copying them currently. We're gonna take a look at moving them in a little bit. So why are we written a for loop? Why can't we just use mem copy? Well, we can't use mem copy because we actually need to be hitting the copy constructor of all of these elements. If we had a bunch of integers or floats or any kind of primitive type, that's totally fine. We can just use mem copy. But for more complex types like classes that might have allocations of their own, which the copy constructor will then perform a deep copy on, it's important for us to actually make sure that we're calling that copy constructor. Otherwise, our classes and more complex types won't get copied correctly. After we've copied everything into this new block, we can just delete our old block, which is of course called mData. We can then set mData to be our new block. And finally, make sure that our capacity matches our new capacity. Size here remains intact because it's not the responsibility of reallocation to actually set the size, it's more or less in charge of the capacity. Now there's one little flaw here, and that is that this will theoretically only work for growing our size. If we want to downsize our allocation from a larger block to a smaller block, it this for loop isn't really going to work because it of course relies on M size being smaller than this new capacity. Otherwise, we're going to overflow our array here. We can just do a little check though to make sure that if we are downsizing, we only copy up to new capacity size of elements. And so to do that, I'll just write a quick if statement here that will just check to see if new capacity is less than size. And if the new capacity is less than our current size, we'll simply set size to new capacity and make sure that we use this size variable here. Now, since we are reallocating though, which means that this new block is in fact not going to contain M size anymore, we should actually update the size. And because of that, we can simplify this a little bit and just change it to be M size like this. So we're actually directly going to be changing the size of our vector if for some reason we downsize it. Now, this is definitely something that you could argue is not the responsibility of this realloc function. And I would probably agree with you, but to keep things simple, we're going to leave it like this. That's it. That is our entire reallocation function. We should now be able to easily grow or shrink our vector as needed. So now let's write a simple pushback function. Now these are usually void in the STL. I like to actually have them return the, the element that we're pushing back. But again, to keep things simple, we'll keep them void here. So what we're gonna do here is push back an element. So how do we do that? Well, it's pretty simple. We can just say m data at m size equals value. And then we should obviously increment size. So we can either do that here, or maybe to keep things a little bit more simple, we can do it down here. This is the basic way that we put things into an array, of course. But the problem is if we're trying to push back an element and there's no room for it, we need to call this realloc function. So to do that, we simply check to see if size is greater than or equal to the capacity. So in other words, if we're at capacity or somehow over it, then we need to reallocate with some kind of new capacity. So to do that, we'll simply call a realloc. And as mentioned before, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our capacity and add half of our capacity to it. So we're basically growing this by 1.5 times every time we need to grow, which is effectively growing by 50%. And that is it. We're now copying this element over here, which is pretty cool. Now, finally, it's probably good to actually see what our size is. That might be important. So let's make a size function here, which just returns M size. And finally, for mark one of this vector class, we're going to add an operator, our index operator here, so that we can actually access our data. So we'll write a const version of this and a non-const version of this, which will simply return mData at index. And of course, I will also write a non-const version of this in case we actually want to use it to modify the value inside the array. Okay, so clearly there's a flaw here, which is what do we do if we're trying to access an index outside of the bounds of the array, typically the way that the vector class in the STL would handle this is it would have an assert here if this index was greater than our size, but only in debug mode or if we've got like STL debugging enabled essentially. So you could do that. You could just say if index is greater than or equal to M size, 
then maybe you want to like assert here or something like that. We're not going to bother doing that here today, but that is definitely something that you would probably want to do because if you just simply do an assert here, then it will be stripped from release builds anyway and you won't suffer any performance penalties, but in debug builds, you'll have that extra debug ability and that extra information of just knowing if you're accidentally going outside of the bounds of your array. Anyway, here is our extremely simple vector class. Don't worry, we're going to improve it in a minute, but I do want to test it out here. So what I'll do is I'll add three elements here because remember that should trigger a reallocation. I want to quickly write a function here though that's going to actually print our vector. Now, because we don't know what type it is, we'll have to make this a template function because of course this could be a vector of any type. So let's go ahead and take in a, a const vector of t, we'll call this vector. Then we'll write a for loop, which goes through all of the elements here. So size t i equals zero, i is less than vector dot size i plus plus, and then we'll just print vector i sdc out vector i. I'll also just add in a little divider here in case we want to print many of these at once. Okay, cool. So now if I call print vector with this vector, let's see what we get. All right, check this out. So we get Cherno, C++ and vector. And of course we, we, we never specified a size or anything like that. Our vector seems to work. Let's go ahead and just add vector a few more times as a basic test. And of course, here it is, it works fine. If we put a little breakpoint over here, just so that we can see where our vector is at, we can see that we have a size of eight, a capacity of nine, of course, because it went from six to nine and everything seems pretty good to me. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this whole copying thing and also write a new function called in place back, which is a very, very useful function to have inside our vector class. What I'll do to demonstrate this is I'll simply write a struct here called vector three, it's just gonna be like a mathematical kind of three component vector here. X, Y, Z, we're going to write a constructor here that takes in, well, let's just write a default constructor that does nothing. Maybe I'll initialize these to zero just to be nice here. Then I'm going to write just a scalar constructor that sets each of these to whatever the scalar is set to. In fact, I might just drop this down here to make it a little bit easier to read. So we'll do X, Y, Z is set to the scalar. And then finally, we'll also write a constructor here that just takes in X, Y, and Z and just sets that up. Okay, cool. So the point of this is, of course, to write a copy constructor here, which obviously isn't necessary for this class, but the reason we're doing this is so that we can actually see when our vectors are being copied. So we'll just say copy, and we'll of course need to actually copy our data. And I'll also write a destructor here, which is going to say destroy. And then finally, I'll write a move constructor here. So now of course we should be able to detect copies, moves and destroys, which is pretty cool. Last thing we're kind of missing is the constructor, but we won't worry about that. So let's change this over to actually be our vector. So we now have a vector of vector threes. I'm gonna go ahead and create some of these. So maybe one of these will be a scalar. I'll I'll remove some of these just to make this less complex. One of them will take in X, Y, Z here. And then one of them maybe will just be a default constructor. So we have three of these. Let's hit a five and see what we get. Now in my haste here, I of course didn't actually provide any assignment or move operators. So let's quickly do that. And now with these two assignment operators present, let's hit a five. We need to also make sure that we print vector three correctly because there's no way to just print it like a string like this. So to make that happen, we'll just copy and paste this and write a specialization for our templated print function here that just takes in a vector of vector threes specifically and we'll print X, Y, and Z. Okay, cool. Now, if we hit a five, everything should work. And of course we need to make sure that this print vector function is actually underneath this struct declaration. Otherwise it has no idea what a vector three is. Okay, let's hit a five. Everything should now finally work. All right, so we have a lot of stuff happening here. We have a copy, we have a destroy, we have a copy, copy, destroy, destroy, copy, destroy, lots of stuff going on. On, but finally, of course, we get this result. Now, this whole next step of this video is going to be all about reducing these copies and destroys because we just simply don't need to be doing so many copies every time we want to do this. In fact, you can see we're pushing back three different vectors. We're actually copying this four times. Now for a vector, I wanna stress that this, there's nothing really you can do about that. And it's also not something that's even worth optimizing because this is just simply three floats. Copying three floats, which is 12 bytes of memory, is never really a problem. You would probably never want to optimize that, but just think of vector three as potentially a string or something that might actually have a heap allocation. Every time we do copy, we have to reallocate that heap memory somewhere else. 
and then free the old one. This is obviously not very good for performance and there are ways to improve that. And that's what this is going to be about. So first step, you'll notice here that all of these are actually temporaries. These are not variables that exist elsewhere. And then finally we're deciding to push them back into a vector, no. The only reason they're here is because we want to basically give them to the vector. So one thing that we could do is write a different pushback function that actually takes in a temporary. So if we say t ampersand ampersand to create an r value reference, what we can now do is effectively the same thing here, except instead of just simply assigning m data to value, we're going to actually move it in there. Now move just simply casts this value to be an r value reference. You can see it's already an r value reference, but there's a bit of a trick, which is as soon as you actually enter a function, if it's a parameter like this, this now becomes an L value. And since it's an L value, we need to be like, no, 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 I want this to be an R value, seriously, for the purposes of moving this in here. So now if this, if this overload is used, which it will be for all of these cases, because they're all R values, we should not see any copy coming from this actual pushback function. It should be moving it. And if you're confused about L values and R values, as well as move semantics, all that, I have a bunch of videos about that. I'll link them in, in the top right corner. Definitely check them out. Let's see what we get here. So now you can see we have move, destroy, copy, copy, destroy, destroy, move, destroy. So this is much better now. We're doing moves instead of copies every time we push back an element. However, when we need to reallocate our vector, we're going back and copying that. So how do we fix that? Well, pretty simple. If we go back to vector.h, inside this realloc function, where I said we should probably move this, we can just say that, well, hey, let's cast this to be an R value reference and try and move it. Because guess what? If there's no move constructor for this type, it is just gonna copy it. So everything will be safe here. And obviously for primitive types like integers and floats and whatever, it's not gonna do anything really. So there's really no downside to just making this move if able to especially because obviously in this case, we are actually trying to move it. We know that the old data is about to be deleted. If this was actually supposed to be a copy, we would obviously not want to move it. Let's hit F5. Okay, look at that, amazing. No more copies now. We're just moving our data across. Great, but what about in place back? Well, in place back is a little bit of a special function that exists inside the std vector class. And it's really, really useful. What it does is it basically says that, well, instead of constructing this vector three instance over here inside the stack frame of main, and then moving it into that data storage we have inside vector, which is what we're currently doing. Why don't you just give me all of the arguments that, you, that I need to actually construct a vector three and I'll do the construction right there in place in my data block. That's what in place back does. So in other words, if we were to rewrite this to be in place back, it would just not take this in at all. It would literally just take a list of arguments in. So it would look something like this. And for this one, well, it would just look like nothing at all. It wouldn't take any arguments because we want to construct it with a default constructor. So how do we make this work? Well, we have to use variadic templates, which of course are everyone's favorite templates. Who gets confused by those, am I right? But in all seriousness, it's really not that difficult. What we'll do here is we'll write a template which takes in a variable number of args, which we will call args because that's a good name for it. We'll, re we'll actually return a T reference here because since we're constructing something in place, it's not really that easy for us to get that object back. So usually these functions return a T reference. I'll call it in place back, of course. And now we'll just take in all of our arguments here. Now I might make a video in the future about variadic templates. And when I do, I'll expand a lot more on them because honestly, they definitely fill up a video. So we'll make sure that we have our same reallocation behavior. And then we'll do M data M size equals T. So we're constructing a T here. And what we'll do is forward all of our arguments to the constructor, but we're going to add a little triple dot here to actually unpack these arguments because we basically want to now say that, okay, all of these variadic template arguments that we've passed over here, I want to expand them so that T gets the correct arguments. So for example, with two, three, four, I would expect to get three floats like that. And that's what we'll get. And of course, if we specify something like two floats, something that isn't compatible with a T constructor, it's not going to work and it will just give us a compile error. Okay, that's actually it. Let's not forget a semicolon here. And you can see that our code looks like it compiles. Let's hit F5. Now we get a build error because it looks like I have just not called my variable with the right name. And of course we forgot to actually return this. So how are we going to return this? We'll simply return m data at m size, not forgetting to increment our size because of course we have just added something to our array or to our vector. All right. 
So there you go. We have move, destroy, move, move, destroy. The destroys are happening because we're actually releasing the old variables, the old vector three instances when we actually move them. But otherwise, this is now looking pretty cool and we're constructing all of our memory in place, which of course is great. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you in this extremely long video now is what happens when we have to destroy everything. Well, of course, in the destructor, we just need to make sure that we simply delete mdata. It's as simple as that. Make sure you use the array deletion operator here to make sure that it both deletes the entire block of memory as well as actually calls the destructor of each element here. Now, this in itself, by the way, is slightly difficult because at the moment we're not holding actual pointers. So if we were holding actual pointers, it would be it would be important for you to actually delete each and every pointer there if you allocate memory every time you emplace back or push back. However, if you've used a vector class before, you know that this isn't the responsibility of the vector class. If you create a vector with a bunch of pointers, which you allocate and then transfer ownership to the vector class, it's your responsibility still to delete them. So this is not something that the vector class should be handling, therefore, this is totally fine. Speaking of calling the destructor, what if we don't want to delete this data block? What if we simply want to resize it by using a function such as pop back? In that case, what exactly happens? Well, obviously size goes down as long as size is greater than zero. We don't want to actually do any kind of resizing. If we're at zero, there's nothing to pop back. But the other important thing that we need to actually do here is call the destructor. And so to do that, after we actually reduce the size, we'll say m data at m size, which should still be a valid element, of course, will explicitly call the destructor like so. This will effectively nullify our object and release any resources that it might own. Because from this point forward, you should no longer have any kind of reference to T. Now there is you you, sh you should you should never have any kind of reference to this. And then finally, since we're on a roll of deleting things here, let's also write a clear function. This is going to do the same thing as pop back essentially, and you could just have a while loop that just pops back until size is zero. But what I'm going to do is just take the more simple approach, write a for loop, which calls the destructor of every single element here. And then I'm going to set size to zero. And there we go. So let's let's try this out now. Let's go back to main. I'm going to add maybe a few more vectors here, which I'll kind of randomize a little bit here just to have something a little bit more interesting. And then what I'll do is I'll pop back a few of these. So maybe let's do pop back in the middle here. Let's pop back two things. Then let's maybe clear this. Then let's maybe, you know, in place back these two again. I'll add some print vectors basically everywhere here so that we can see what happens after all of these stages. Let's hit F5. Okay, well, we didn't crash, that's good news. Let's take a look at what happened here because there's a lot of stuff. Move, destroy, blah, blah, blah. Don't really care about the, those things too much. We have our 111, which is our scalar constructor here, 234, 134, and our empty vector, that looks good. Then we print it. Then we've popped back two elements here, which we've destroyed both of. We're then printing our vector, which as you can see, gives us these two again, because those are the ones that remain inside the vector. We're then in placing back two more elements here. And of course, here they are added at the end of our vector. We're then doing a clear, which is destroying all of these four vectors that we have here. And then finally, we're doing a move, destroy, move, destroy as we push back two more elements. There they are. And then we're actually printing that vector twice. Now these move destroys here from the in place back are actually coming from this function itself, because you can see that it's actually constructing a temporary here, which is then moving into here. And we can, of course, check that if we hit a five and take a look at this F10 is is doing a move destroy, as you can see. Now, technically, if you're a keen observer, you may in fact deduce that, well, is that any better than this pushback R value reference function? Because isn't it just doing a move at the end of the day anyway, even if it is in fact constructing the object in this stack frame instead of the main one? And you would be correct. How would you solve that? Leave a comment below. This is like a little bit of an advanced exercise perhaps. And the answer of course is, well, I want to construct my object. I just want to do it in place of this actual memory. Now this memory exists. We know that it exists because we've actually allocated that memory. So now it's a matter of, well, instead of constructing this object on the stack and in place back and then moving it into M data storage, how about you just construct it inside M data? So how do we construct things in place? Well, 
we can actually use the placement new operator. Now new might be scary here because you might associate that with heap allocations, but if you use a placement new, you're providing the actual memory for the object to be constructed in, which is obviously coincidentally exactly what we want here. So what we can do is actually grab the memory address of this element because this is where it's supposed to live and then simply forward these arguments into that constructor, not forgetting the actual type that we're trying to construct. So as simple as that. And by doing this, if we pop a breakpoint here and relaunch this, we have nothing in our console at the moment. Let's hit F10. We have nothing in our console. So no moves have been done and no destroys have been done. How cool is that? Let's hit F5. Check this out. Everything still works. Everything looks a lot tidier. Of course, it still needs to move and destroy when we actually reallocate, but that's it. Look how clean this looks now. So that is the advanced tip of the day. Don't forget about placement new for constructing objects in place. Now, even though we've spent quite a long time writing this vector class here today, and I hope that this was helpful to you, there are still so many things that one would want to add to this class, such as probably the number one thing being arrays. How do I remove elements from this? Well, you can't at this stage. And that's why even though this reallocation function technically supports shrinking, we're not shrinking anywhere. And in addition to that, what if I want to emplace an element or push an element into the middle of the vector? What do I do there? That's also something that you would probably want to implement. Although keep in mind that if you're trying to replace things and remove things from the middle of vectors, maybe you don't want to use a vector data structure because of course the memory has to be contiguous and therefore you'll trigger potentially a reallocation or at the very least having to shift and move all of those elements down to make up for the gap or the extra space that you've created. And then also we would probably want iterators. So there are still a number of things we would want to discuss. Perhaps we'll cover them in a later episode of this C++ series but there you have it, a basic implementation of our vector class. Haha, <laughs> did you think that was it? There is a glaring flaw that I have left in this vector class. If anyone knows what it is, please leave a comment below. And if, in fact, if it was up to me, I'd probably end the episode here and have like a to be continued thing and leave this all on you. But I, of course, don't want to publish a video with, with bugs in the code I've written. So I am going to address this now. The problem has to do with how we allocate and deallocate memory. Specifically, the problem lies in this delete call over here and also potentially in this delete call here. As you know, we're manually calling the destructor in both the popback and the clear function, which is, you know, I mean, a lot of care needs to be taken when you're manually calling the destructor because the worst thing that can happen is the delete function also calls the destructor. And for a type like vector three here, that's not really gonna do any harm. However, let's make vector three a little bit more of a complex type. Let's go ahead and just add some kind of, you know, memory block into this vector three class. I'll go down here into the constructor, in fact, into all of the constructors. Now I'll just make it so that we allocate maybe like five integers or whatever on the heap. So basically we've created a memory block that we now need to deallocate. I'll add this exact code into everywhere else. I'm not gonna bother formatting this code or anything like that. You need to make sure that in the copy constructor, we actually copy it. I'm not gonna bother with that because we're not actually calling the copy constructor anywhere. But in our move constructor, what we will do is just make sure that our memory block is going to just be equal to other memory blocks. So we're stealing that pointer and then setting other memory block to be null. We'll need to make sure that we write this code, otherwise it's gonna be our fault that nothing works. And we'll do the same thing for the move assignment operator. And again, the copy assignment operator and copy constructor just simply aren't called anywhere else. And in fact, to simplify that and to make sure that is the case, I'm just gonna make sure that I actually delete both of them so that we're sure that we're never accidentally copying anything. So now what we've got is a move constructor that properly moves that memory block and our general constructors, I forgot one here, the default one, that allocates this memory block. Finally, we're going to deallocate it, so delete it inside the destructor. This is the proper usage of this class. If it was to have a memory block, this is totally fine. We can set it to null pointer if we want by default, but you can see every constructor initializes it anyway. So now that we've got this, let's surround our vector in a little bit of a scope. Technically, we don't have to do this. It should crash anyway, but just to be safe, when we get to the end of this scope and our stack allocation for vector is over, it's going to try and delete this. So this is in fact going to call operator delete on the memory block inside the vector class and inside the vector three class, sorry for picking such confusing names, vector and vector three, my bad it's going to try and delete that memory block. This is gonna prove slightly problematic because we've popped back and cleared and done various other things. So let's hit F5. Okay, look at that, we get an error. 
And if we kind of drill down here a little bit, it's because we're trying to delete a memory block. And the problem will be that this is a memory block that has already been deleted. We can also try and simplify this a little bit just to pinpoint the problem exactly. If I just do a couple of in place backs here with nothing really too scary, it's gonna work fine. We're not gonna get any crashes. But when we start to actually play around with it a little bit, and especially with pop back, because we've called the destructor of vector three, which has in fact deleted this over here, then what happens when we call this? We're going to land in a world of hurt. So how do we get around this? Well, we still have to call the destructor here. There's no real way around that. What we need to do instead is change the way that we allocate and deallocate memory. So specifically, vector destructor is going to call clear, which of course is going to go through everything and manually call the destructor. So now what we need to do is the new and delete operators that we use, we instead want to use versions that do not call the constructor or destructor. So how do we do that? Well, keep in mind, this is, there shouldn't be any constructors being called here at all anyway. So there's no point at which we need to call a constructor. All we need to do here is essentially just malloc enough memory to fill up this new capacity. So how do we do that? Well, we're not actually gonna use malloc because we're using C++. Instead, we're going to use operator new. I'm just gonna put into the global namespace like this to make sure it works properly. So operator new, and then into here, we need to provide the amount of space that we want to allocate. So how many bytes do we wanna allocate? Well, this is gonna be new capacity times the size of our type that we're actually storing, like that. This is going to return void, so we need to make sure in C++ to cast it to a T pointer. Same with delete. Instead of calling delete like this, we're actually going to call operator delete, and I'll just put that global namespace operator at the front there. We're going to delete our data block, and then we also need to specify the size of memory that we're deleting, which of course will be our existing capacity times size of T. Now, since we're deleting here, we're not actually calling the destructor on all of those old elements. So that is something that we need to do. Keep in mind that we have actually moved them across into this new block now. So it should be safe to call the destructor on those. So I'll go through size once again. Worth noting here that it should be our original size in the case of shrinking, but this isn't something we're gonna talk about today because we don't have shrinking. And all we're going to do is into m data i, I just want to basically call the destructor. So this is kind of like doing a clear, except we're doing a clear on m data. In fact, I think clear does exactly what we want. I mean, it also sets the size to zero. So to make this a little bit more simple, we could just call clear like that. Everything is safe in the new block anyway. And now that we've done that, we of course reassigned data and new capacity. The only thing that, that clear has actually done is also set our size to zero, which is slightly problematic. So I'm actually gonna go back on that. I'm actually just gonna copy this and replace it with clear here, just so that we leave our size intact. And that should be the end of this new realloc function. And finally, of course, with this delete up here, instead of doing that kind of array delete operator there, we're going to call operator delete m data and then m capacity times size of t. This will not call any destructors. Clear is what will go through and call all of the destructors. So now if we go back to our, our original scenario, let's hit F5 and hopefully we won't get any crashes. And you can see our program runs successfully, no crashes whatsoever. We're still firing the destructor wherever we need and that should, emphasis on should, be bug free. So that now hopefully is our more or less proper implementation of a basic vector class. Kudos to those of you who picked up on that bug. Since we're already here and this video is already way too long, let's quickly do a test of this vector on primitive types. This is also a really useful thing to add to your test. I'll say like int vector or something like that. Just because when you're working with class types, it's sometimes easy to forget things like maybe integers don't have destructors and well, they don't, but this will this code will still work because they have like a default. There's a whole thing about it, which we're not going to get into today. But if I push back like five or maybe like in place back, like something else, you know, let's maybe uh, add enough to cause a reallocation. Let's try and do a pop back like that. And maybe also a clear and this will, this is just another little test to make sure that everything does in fact run and compile correctly when we're dealing with integers. Since integers are easy to also kind of print, we can chuck in a little print vector in vector like that and our template function should take care of that. Let's check it out. 
And there we go, we have our integers here and here. Everything seems to be running well. So that is hopefully the end of the vector class for now. Congratulations if you made it this far. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. As I said, there are so many more features I would want to add to this class, such as the erase function, but also iterators. We haven't covered iterators yet. I'm gonna make a video on that very soon in the future. And once we do, I want to revisit both the array class and this class to make it work with things like range-based for loops. But anyway, I hope this video was helpful and that you learned something new. Let me know in the comments below how writing your own implementation of this went and how it compared to the solution that I gave here. And if you're feeling like doing some bonus work, definitely take a look at implementing both the erase function as well as the whole iterator situation. And if you want to go even beyond that, then take a look at the STL version of the vector class and see what, what that has that we're missing here and try and implement some of those features. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to check out your two months of free Skillshare Premium using the link in the description below. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.